you'll get other ideas and and it'll change and you'll start to play with it and that's i i definitely enjoy that liberty of just like being able to do whatever i want essentially i'm really passionate about putting out good food and like giving people that experience so it's one of the main reasons why i'm so adamant and i am so crazy you might call it when it comes to these things <laughs> From the cubicle to the lab, the studio to the war room, climbing the corporate ladder or joining a scrappy startup, experience a day in the life of the jobs you want. This is the Experience a Day in the Life podcast. We interview professionals, entrepreneurs, and recent grads about what a day is actually like on the job, hour by hour, or as we like to call it, they're a diddle, spelled A-D-I-T-L, which stands for a day in the life. This podcast will inspire you to gain experience beyond the classroom and launch a career of your own. We're your hosts, Chris DeBeau and Matt Poe. Welcome to part one in the two-part Cooking Up a Career series. In this episode, we'll experience a day in the life of Manny Gonzalez Charles, the executive chef at Society Cafe in New York City. So you can decide if this is a career that's right for you. Manny's life, he told us, is basically a prep list. If tasks aren't checked off when they're supposed to be checked off, that allows for chaos later in the day. Running a seasonal locally sourced restaurant in the Walker Hotel, every day is different for Chef Manny. But one thing remains the same. The food, atmosphere, and company culture is always top priority. Let's get right into the day. It's 6.30 a.m. on a Monday, Manny's alarm went off, and the first thing he did on this day, like most days, is check open table for reservations at the restaurant. This helps him plan his day and gives him an idea of how busy he'll be. Mondays, he told us, tends to be busy, which he'll tell us why in a bit. He exercised, walked his dog, and was out the door by 7.30 a.m. from Jersey City to Greenwich Village in New York City by 8 a.m. On the agenda for this day were line checks, food delivery checks, prep list reviews, food cost and payroll accounting, a green market visit, produce and meat orders, and of course, well, cooking. Society Cafe is open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, which means Chef Manny's at work for breakfast, lunch, and dinner most days. Let's meet him and learn more about what he does. So my name is uh, Manuel Gonzalez Charles. I am the executive chef of uh, Society Cafe. It's located on 13th Street between 5th and 6th Avenue. And basically, I am in charge of running the food and beverage department at the hotel. The other day, I was realizing, man, I also got to be a, a psychologist, you know, <laughs> uh, I have to be on top of numbers, managing people, and ensuring the quality of the food is great, creating new items. We're very much a seasonal restaurant. Our menu changes four to five times a, a year, as well as we do a lot of daily specials from stuff that we encounter at the market. So a chef, an executive chef does have a lot of roles and uh, it is very much a hard job, but I feel if your passion's in it, you will never work a day in your life. As we mentioned, Mondays are typically tough because he's starting the week fresh in every sense. While it might not be the busiest for table traffic, like most restaurants, Chef Manny gets really busy regardless. The restaurant food and beverage supply needs recouping from the business over the weekend, payroll needs to be inputted, food costs need to be recorded, and on top of all of this, he still needs to lead the team and assist them with preparing and cooking meals. It's a lot to stay on top of. That's why on his commute, he already is thinking about how to attack the day. A lot of times when I'm in my commute, I do, you know, sometimes I do read emails. I do think about specials. I do think about, about my day, you know what I mean? How to, how to attack it. I feel those first couple hours that you're there, you know, you just got to be really organized as a chef because time is valuable. Time is the, you know, it's the most precious thing that you could ever have in a kitchen. For me, it's very important just to like, once I get there, hit the ground running. You know what I mean? So a year at the, at the restaurant by eight, could you set the scene a little bit? So every time I walk in, I walk in, I go to the host stand. I like to say hello to everybody upstairs. I, I like to take a quick peek at the dining room. 
sometimes you know as a chef you'll see something that's like out of place or hey like somebody that needs help it also lets me know okay if the dining room is full maybe the kitchen needs some help so let me go down there real quick i think it's a beautiful dining room ceiling has all the gold it's very uh, glamorous and i definitely like the little window in the ceiling you know mm -hmm. i think to me like everybody wants to sit there during brunch it's the perfect little spot it's great for pictures too <laughs> <laughs> so i just quickly uh, look at the dining room make sure everything's going okay and i head on downstairs as soon as i go go downstairs i drop on my stuff and i like you know i like to say hi to everybody and just make sure hey how you doing you know uh, no matter how busy we are you you know you you just everybody deserves a, a good morning all right so yeah, so we, we like to do line checks for breakfast, for lunch, and for dinner. So for every new um, meal period, it takes obviously different types of prep. Essentially what it is, is just me walking through the kitchen, opening all the fridges, looking at the, the stuff they have, looking at dates, tasting stuff, you know, just making sure that everything's up to standard and up to par. Uh, and, and that's pretty much what a line check is. You just go down the cooking line and you just check everything and make sure everything's okay. So for breakfast, we have everything from the classic uh, pancakes with caramelized bananas, candied pecans. We'll have French toast in the weekends. We'll have a chukchuka, which is uh, two baked eggs in a, in a tomato sauce with shishitos and chorizo. We, obviously, we have the classics, the omelets, the benedicts, all that stuff, the salmon toast, bagels. And, and then right after that, like as, as soon as I see everybody's doing okay, you know, I, uh, I go into my next step, which is more administrative, uh, where I just have to sit in the computer, which it's not my favorite, I would mm. say. <laughs> 8.30 a.m., it was time to tackle the food costs and payroll. He's gathering all the invoices and inputting them on his worksheet along with their sales to calculate food cost. The restaurant's goal is to be under 30% monthly. Doing this helps give Manny an idea of how much they have to spend weekly. For payroll, he's managing overtime, vacation days, sick days for four chefs, an executive sous chef, and a junior sous chef. From 9.30 a.m. to around 11.45 a.m., Chef Manny was in the kitchen helping prepare dinner for that night. On the menu was agnolotti pasta, cavatelli pasta, snapper fish, and all the parts of the fresh chicken to make stock, wings, breast, thighs, etc. They use every part of every ingredient for efficient and sustainable practices. If you're wondering how involved Manny gets in the kitchen, he told us he's a player coach type of leader. I'm one of the ones that if somebody calls out, I'll more times than none, I'll jump in the line and cook myself and I'll run service behind the line. I saw a lot of chefs that, you know, no matter what was going on, the world could be falling and they would be calm and they stepped up a lot. And I look up to that. I, I've always looked up to managers that do. I told myself I want to be the same way. As a leader, you got to you gotta lead by example. On to the chef stuff. So 9.05, you're starting the Angelotti? Agnolotti. Agnolotti Dugla? Uh, so it's agnolotti dough. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> so how do you make it? What's Give us the whole lowdown on how so, okay. this works. So uh, pasta is the way. So this is a stuffed pasta. Pasta is the way it works. Is like once you make the dough, you want to let it rest for at least a good hour. For agnolotti dough, you basically need, uh, obviously, eggs, flour, a little bit of olive oil, salt. You want to put all the dry ingredients in the mixer first. And then slowly add the egg yolks, the whole eggs, and, and olive oil and stuff and mix it in thoroughly. After it comes out of the mixer, you just want to knead it with your hands and kind of, in other words, form a ball, right? Wrap it up and you want to let it rest. So that's why this is one of those projects that I should do uh, very early during the day so that I can like use it an hour later. Making pasta is very messy. You're, you're, you know, we wear black uh, chef jackets and you'll get flour everywhere. But this actually happens to me with a lot of things uh, <laughs> that at first, like, maybe I'm not the biggest fan, but after doing it in a while and, like, you start getting better at it and then you start to enjoy it. So for me, pasta, like I said, it was definitely not, it was definitely not my favorite project through practice and uh, like I said, repetition, I ended up loving it. And for me, it's one of my it's one of my passions. So I, I you'll notice a lot when I'm in the kitchen, if I'm doing pasta, like sometimes I don't like people will talk to me. I'll be in my own world. So it also lets me think about other things, other projects I want to do. And then when it's all said and done, is it like a square? Is it noodles? Is it so like no, what is so it? For Agnolotti, it's uh, Agnolotti, it translates into uh, little pillows, right? Oh, okay. So uh. picture <laughs> a pillow. For this one, we're doing uh, the stuffed Agnolotti. So what you do is that you roll like a big strip, you put filling, and then you kind of roll it, close it down, and then you cut it off. 
So it's a little bit more complicated than the than the ravioli, but the agnolotti actually was my white whale. It was uh, <laughs> one of those items that we just couldn't get it right, and it drove me crazy. And that's the reason why I put it on the menu, because I put it on the menu, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to figure out how to do this shit. <laughs> <laughs> I because, love that. Uh, yeah, because I want to do it, and I'm going to figure it out, and it's going to be on the menu. So I have a week to figure out how to do perfect agnolotis. And we did it, obviously. So, all right, what's the filling? So the filling, I actually use uh, braised straw ribs. I add uh, a little bit of truffle oil, creme fraiche, chives, shallots, a little bit of salt and pepper. Uh, but definitely the braising of the short ribs makes it, yeah. you know what I mean? Oh, my God. That sounds delicious. And then I use that same sauce to to make the the pasta sauce. The same braising liquid, that ends, ends up being the pasta sauce. Next, he helped make the red wine jus sauce, a technique he learned from Chef Leem in a kitchen he previously worked at. We'll talk more about his culinary career journey in part two. Making sauce is another passion of his because it's a long, artful process takes about five hours six hours depending it teaches you not only to follow correct steps but to just constantly it's like a stew you want to sear some meat scraps uh after that you're going to add some veg deglaze the fawn that's formed with some wine and then finish it with veal stock pork stock whatever sauce you're trying to make you obviously add herbs and uh and uh, spices to it uh, to give it different types of flavor. But uh, this is one of those projects that when it starts, the sauce is going to be very loose. It's not going to have a lot of concentrated flavor. So you want to skim it, try it, adjust, skim it, try and adjust till it comes to a nappe type of consistency. I'm going to tell you what that is right <laughs> <Yeah>. now. <laughs> that was my follow up. <laughs> so nappe is something. So picture if you take the back of the spoon, right, and you dip it in sauce and then you draw a line across the spoon. If the sauce goes through the line, it's not ready. If it's not pay, it'll just like stay. So I don't know if you notice when you guys go to eat, if uh, they say like a steak with a red wine sauce will be like a thick sauce, right? Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much what it is. Oh. So you want to take it to that level, you know, so, uh, not only because of the flavor, texture and all that stuff, but but yeah, but it's one of those projects that if uh, say if at some point you kind of forget it, you can mess it up and lose five hours of your day. You definitely have to be on top of it. You have to watch it and all that stuff. You can really put the, together the pieces of why it's so important to prioritize. Because yeah. It's like you got to layer all these yeah. different processes on, each, on top of each other. It's uh, And that's, yeah, that's why like I, I, my life is a prep list. <laughs> I could not, I could not, you know, my life is a prep list. I, I come in and like I said, everything is done in a specific order for a specific reason. And, you know, every, everything has uh, different timelines and different procedures. So, like I said, if I, I adhere by this uh, prep list that we make daily, that's what pretty much guides my day. And that's why I have to do so early in the morning so that it's ready by 530. 1015 and the cavatelli dough was next on the list. This pasta is made with ricotta cheese, and he told us it's a quick preparation similar to the agnolotti process he outlined earlier, but softer. 1045, he butchered a chicken, which is another favorite pastime of his, and right before he left for the market at 1145, he broke down a snapper fish. We do sell a lot of chicken here because we run it, you know, during, the, during lunch we sell a lot with salads, and for dinner we have our own chicken dish that sells a lot, right? I think we're butchering chickens almost every day. For me, butchering is uh, one of those things that you'll notice that not every chef knows how to do. When you're a line cook, most kitchens will have their own butcher, they'll have their own like pasta maker, prep guys. So there's a lot of places where you will not get the opportunity. I do believe that to be a complete chef, you should know how to butcher and you should know how to do everything. So that's why I wanted to learn. When you start running your restaurant, you'll notice that, uh, you know, you want to try and use everything for something. Mm. So we use the carcass or the body of the chicken. We roast them and we make chicken stock with that, as well as all the other bones. We obviously use the breast. For lunch, we only use the breast. For dinner, we use the breast and thigh attached. So uh, whatever uh, thighs we don't use for lunch, we end up breading them for the chicken and waffle. The wings, we either use them for family meal or we use them to make a uh, uh, chicken jus. So everything gets used up, even the chicken skins. Uh, we uh, season them, we uh, crisp them up, and then we crumble them on top of our uh, duck ravioli. So we literally cool. use everything, yeah. 
11.45 on this day, Manny walked over to the Green Market, a visit he makes every Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. As Manny's mentioned, Society Cafe has a seasonal menu complete with dishes that match what ingredients and produce are, quote, in for the season, so the dishes are as fresh as they could possibly be. That also requires some coordination, which is why Manny has a good relationship with the local farmers and vendors. Yes, everything's organic and everything, uh, but it's also a little bit more expensive, right? Because mm-hmm. uh, there's extra, extra little bit of care. And obviously, since I'm a restaurant, I buy in bulk, and, you know, I'll get deals. So that's very important. If not, this whole concept wouldn't really work. So that's why you see a lot of a lot of times in my menu, I do uh, promote the farms. I'll say like Lanny's Farms, uh, Ireland Tomato, or uh, Norwich Farms, uh, Beet Salad. So I like to give that back to them because, like I said, they always treat me very well. So when you're showing up to the green market, do you have kind of a list that you kind of need to check off to get? And then do you ever deviate off that list? I deviate from that list almost every single time. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, so so I have a list of the stuff that I need for the restaurant. Like what? Could it, it could be market greens, garlic scapes, tomatoes, like whatever's in season that I'm using currently. And then uh, I also have the unwritten list, which is basically me going to the market and telling myself, okay, we're going to make a special out of something here. And, you know, I walk through the market a couple of times and usually by that second run through, I have something figured out. I have something, you know, what I want to do. And sometimes I just like to bring uh, stuff and tell my shops here, like, let's, let's have some fun with this, you know. Because ultimately, yeah, I cannot, you got to break from the routine. You got to do new things, you know, and be spontaneous in this job. Otherwise, you know, I, I don't want it to ever feel like a routine. What types of ingredients are specific to fall, specific to winter, specific to spring? So you'll notice that in the spring, it's, uh, I like to call it the green season. And by that, I mean, you'll get the ramps, you'll get a lot of peas, favas, English peas will start to come up and uh, a lot of salad greens. So the menu starts to take a turn to, you know, it looks very green and everything. And then when summer comes around, like I said, you have summer squash, you'll have like the tomatoes. Tomatoes is a big one. Definitely marks the start of quote unquote summer. When you move into into fall, you'll start to get, a, you know, more uh, butternut squash, items of that matter. Like so, and the style of cooking changes a little bit. So it goes from being a little lighter in the summer to, you know, braces, and then you go into winter where you get like root vegetables, like sunchokes, uh, celery root and things like that. There's not so much quote unquote green stuff at the market at this time, obviously, because it's winter. So you get stuff like sweet potato and little things like that. I do like to pride myself by saying that, look, if you find it, if you can't find it at the market, you won't find it here. Chef Manny was back in the kitchen at 1220 and he helped prepare agu pasta, which is a staple dish at Society Cafe. While this was being made, he had to keep his eye on the red wine jus and the chicken stock from earlier. 1 p.m. rolled around and lunch started to pick up a bit, so he started calling tickets, meaning orders, to the line cooks as they came in. He didn't have to on this day, but he's been known to jump back on the line to help cook if needed. Lunch is uh, one of those meal periods where everybody wants to come in and out and be quick, right? So it's uh, you def- it definitely keeps you on your toes, and, and I try to do as much prep as possible while I'm doing this. 2.30, the lunch crowd died down, and Manny was working on preparing chicken sausage with sheep castings for breakfast the next day. The castings are very delicate, so he and his cooks are stuffing it carefully and poaching it afterwards. This process takes up a big chunk of the day, Manny told us. While he oversaw that, he strained and finished the red wine jus sauce and chicken stock from earlier and then moved on to butchering a lamb. 3.45, Manny was perfecting and finalizing the daily specials for dinner that night. This is where his creativity comes in and where his produce from the green market shines. So many times you can you can have something in your head, but uh, once you actually go and do it, and you'll get other ideas and, and it'll change. You'll start to play with it. And that's I, I definitely enjoy that liberty of just like being able to do whatever I want, essentially. I'm really passionate about putting out good food and like giving people that experience. So it's one of the main reasons why I'm so adamant and I am so crazy, you might call it, when it comes to these things. <laughs> I want to talk about family meal. So you do this every day with your entire staff? So yeah, so the, the cooks make family meal. I okay. do not make family meal. <laughs> it's the one thing that I said, like once I become chef, I'm not going to do family meal. <laughs> 
<laughs> I enjoy eating it. Don't yeah. Get me wrong. They, they make great stuff. It's a very important time where, like, people, you know, you, you get to know who you're working with. You get to know the front of the house. There's a lot of restaurants. This is a big division between the front and the back. I like my restaurant. This is what I've learned. I like my restaurants that have that sense of family. I want everybody to be comfortable with everybody. You notice that a lot of us will go out, we'll talk, like, outside of work. So that's definitely the, tr the type of uh, environment I want to create. And everybody eats together. We have a certain amount of time and, you know, that's a, the only half hour where you're not going to be on your feet. Might as well like enjoy it. doesn't matter how busy you are. You have to take a, like at least 15 minutes and just sit down and relax and decompress so that you can keep working. 4.30, Manny knocked out emails from food purveyors and requests and questions the hotel had about future events. And 5 p.m., he called together the front and back of the house staff to taste the daily specials. This part is key every day, so everyone's on the same page to cook and recommend the specials. 5.15, he's putting in his produce order via email, and 5.30, dinner service starts. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, so dinner service is our busiest time. Like, as soon as I'm done with lineup, which is uh, around 5.20, I like to have a quick talk with my uh, cooks and tell them, hey, guys, like, this is what we have today on the books. Uh, we expect to be busy around this time. We have this party. You know, I just give them a, a lowdown. I repeat it. I, I, I like to repeat stuff. I think it's key here. Uh, so I repeat information a lot so that everybody's aware and nobody's caught by surprise. And so that shit doesn't hit the fan. <laughs> right? Nice. When dinner comes around, for me, it's very exciting as well. The whole idea is that everything comes to the window and to the table in unison, right? I don't want you to give me a steak and then have to wait. And that steak, you know, overcooks or something like that while something else gets prepared. So communication is very key. And that's part of the things. That's one of the main things that you're doing when you're expediting. You know, you're just like directing them. When it gets too busy, line cooks can't be reading tickets. You know what I mean? So a lot of them, and I've always cooked like this, like I'll have a chef calling dishes out or calling tickets out to me, and I just work out of memory. It sounds harder, but ultimately it's easier because uh, you just get to cook. And uh, like I said, I repeat a lot. And since I repeat things a lot, people like, uh, you know, it's. I think it makes for a flawless service. So I want to take a little segue here. What are some of the ways shit can hit the fan in in a kitchen right. uh she can hit the fan when uh you're not properly set up okay uh, somebody orders something you don't have it <laughs> somebody for example a cook doesn't give you the right count on protein and you say it's a really busy night and like i said you don't have that you keep selling and you don't have it and then you gotta go to every table i would say it's lack of preparation when you sometimes cooks will be like you know i think i can get away with not having to prep more of this and then he gets really busy. It's Murphy's Law. Like, you don't yeah. prep that, you, that's what you're going to sell that night. And, you know, you can have, like, line cooks, like, either cutting themselves or injuring themselves where they can't work in the middle, middle of a busy night, people calling out. So there's, there's many ways in, uh, in which uh, stuff can go wrong. But I think you're definitely trained and accustomed to dealing with these types of situations as a chef. When service slowed down, Manny slipped away to make the schedule for the next week. After that, he was with the cooks helping expedite tickets and touched a table or two. That means going out to the front of the house and saying hello to some dinner guests, especially VIPs. Fast forward to 1030 at night, a half hour before closing. He took a protein count and placed the order for protein for the next day. Then he went to the PATH train by 1103. What a long day. This is like the longest day you'll have in your life. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm not saying that this is every day. Like, you know, uh, I would say as a chef, I would expect to work 12 to 14 hours. If you're a line cook, maybe a little under that. But yeah, it takes a, lo a lot of hours and it's just how you just manage your time and personal life, which after eight years in New York, I think I've learned how to do <laughs> it a little better. So when you do get home this late, right after a long day, how do you decompress? How do you get to sleep after that huge adrenaline rush? Or are you uh, wiped? I mean, uh, you know, I've always been very energetic. So sometimes I do end up staying uh, awake for a long time. Not a big drinker, but I think, you know, a nice l a little glass of wine helps from time to time. You know, as soon as I come in, my dog comes in and says hi. Like, you know, and, you know, after I see my girlfriend, I feel like you, you kind of like forget about it. You sit, you relax. And 
I think I'm used to like having days like this. So sometimes it's just not like so outside of the norm where like I feel like, oh my God, like I'm totally white. Sometimes you're like more tired the second day, not that day. Uh, it's like kind of like working out mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, when I do work out. But uh, I would say for me, it's always been uh, relatively easy to just come um, through through years of experience and being in the in the industry. So what is your advice for aspiring executive chefs or chefs in general? If you aspire to be a chef, like obviously be ready for the hardship. Be just You got to know coming in that it's a lot of hours. It's going to be a lot of hard work. You're going to feel like quitting a lot. But it, like I said, if it's if it's truly really your passion, just just keep at it and eventually it'll work out for you. Don't get me wrong. There were times where I felt like, man, this is not worth it. I'm not making any money, you know what I mean? And at the beginning, it's going to be like that. But after a while, with hard work, you, you know, you'll be able to make a living out of that. I always like to tell my guys, just like remain hungry. Like, I know I'm the excited sous chef of Society Cafe, and that's a great feat, but I'm still hungry for more. And that's what drives me and keeps me just like, you know, wanting more and more and like wanting to be better. So on that note, that wraps up part one. We just experienced a day in the life of the executive chef of Society Cafe. But how does one actually become an executive chef? In part two of the Cooking Up a Career series, join us as we go through Manny's career journey and experiences leading up to where he is today. Manny actually went to school to become a vet, but after the hospitality and culinary world hit him by surprise, he did what he had to do to pursue a culinary career in New York City. There were some bumps in the road, but his eyes were always on the prize. Learn how he did it next in part two. At Experience a Day in the Life, we're building an online library of content all focused on a diddle or a day in the life of different jobs and professions across the world in all different industries. So if you want to share your a diddle, you can do so at xadiddle.com slash share dash my dash a diddle. That's xaditl dot com slash share dash my dash aditl. Thanks for listening. Head over to xadiddle.com. That's xaditl.com. There you can find the show notes for this series and more A Day in the Life articles. And you can get to know us and our guests more by joining our communities on social media. Follow at xadiddle on Instagram and on LinkedIn by searching for Krista Bow and Matt with one T Poe. If you learned something in this episode, please take some time to help our mission by leaving a positive rating and review of the show. Each week, we bring you a new interview series with guests from different jobs and different industries. In each series, we'll live a specific day in the life, hour by hour, and experience their career journey. So don't forget to subscribe.